Hello? Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Okay. Bear with us. We're getting the Zoom meeting up. Our Facebook live feed is getting up, so we are just a few minutes start from starting here. The one wonders of technology. All right. I, I'm not. Uh, is the video up for you guys yet? I we cannot see you, Mike, but we can hear you just fine without any issues. Can you see our video? Uh, no, I cannot. But I don't need to see your lovely faces. He's straightforward on you. Very good. It, it right. said that the video was on, but okay, but it's not. Okay. All right. The time is one thirty-one, and I hereby call the January what thirteenth meeting of the Area Board of Zoning Appeals to order. Uh, before we begin, we do have a few announcements. Um, this meeting is being held in person in the fourth floor council chamber of the county city building with Zoom video, phone teleconferencing, and now Facebook Live options available via links and phone information posted on our website, sjcindiana.com slash abza. In case anyone needs the phone information, our call-in number is 312-626-6799. The meeting ID is 939-70-724560, and the password is 306-285. We will mute people calling in or using Zoom until the public hearing portion is opened. If you are on the phone, please use star nine to use the raise hand feature to be called upon and you can use star six to unmute. To use the raise hand feature on Zoom, click the controls at the bottom of your screen. If you have two computer video windows open or a live phone or phone line active with a video window open at the same time, you will create an echo effect making it impossible for anyone to hear, so please choose one or the other options. In consultation with the St. Joseph County Department of Health, the following protocols will be in place for all meetings held in the council chambers. Face coverings will be required for everyone in chambers, including board members, presenters, petitioners, and members of the public. Regarding public comment, we will first ask for any public comment from those sitting in the chambers and then in the auxiliary seating in the building. Once those in person once those in person have provided their comments, those calling into the meeting remotely will be given the opportunity to provide public comment. Those wishing to provide public comment in person should line up at the footprint stickers on the floor leading to the podium as um, either the petition is being read or as we open up the, um, if you're the petitioner, you can come to the podium as uh, Sam's reading the petition. If you are here for or against the petition, you can come up when we open up that uh, portion of the meeting. On your meeting? Hand sanitizer has been placed next to the podium. Back there. We ask that you sanitize your hands after you leave the podium area. Sign in sheets for public comment have been removed to prevent anyone from touching the same pen. <laughs> for this reason, please clearly state your name and address for the record so Sam can actually note it in the minutes. Please do not be surprised if you are asked to spell your name for the record <laughs> and your speaking time will not start until after that is done. We appreciate your compliance with these guidelines and your patience as we navigate these unprecedented times. Due to wearing face coverings and for the benefit of people listening on the phone, we ask that board members state their name when making a motion in a second. Lastly, please silence your cell phones so they do not disturb others in the meeting. Uh, with that, we will open up our first uh, portion of this meeting is actually the appointment of the chair and vice chair for the 2021 board. Um, Brandy, is that something that you need to facilitate? Uh, as the previous board president, you serve until there's another one, so uh, you can conduct it. We didn't do it that way last year because our board got reconstituted, and I think all of our officers were no longer on the board. Understood. Okay, so as we have to do every year, I believe, um, we will open the, open the meeting with, um, I'll take a nomination for chair of the board. Oh, sorry. Sam has asked me to do a roll call first. Uh, Sam, would you do a roll call? Mr. Hawley. President Bob Hawley. Mr. Ritzema. Present. Mr. Schaefer. Here. 
Ms. Deutscher? Present. Mr. Urbanski? Present. Mr. Velleman? Present. Okay. We have multiple new board members. Welcome all. Hopefully we'll be able to see you in person sometime this year. Um, so uh, back to the original statement. Um, I would entertain a motion um, and then a second for chair of this Area Board of Zoning Appeals for 2021. I would like to uh, nominate Mr. Bellman. Mike Urbanski is speaking. Bob Holly seconds. We have a motion and a second. Is that just an all in favor or do we have to do individuals on that, Brandy? Uh, that can be an all in favor. Okay. Everyone in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, I'll entertain a motion for a vice chair for the 2021 Area Board of Zoning Appeals. Okay, I would nominate uh, Mr. Schaefer as vice chair oh, for 2021. Ooh. Any seconds? Second, Pat. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Anyone opposed? You were here in person, so you got nominated. That's how it works. <laughs> you should have been on Zoom. <laughs> Usually it's the person that doesn't show up that gets nominated for that stuff. So. Yeah. All right. Anything else that we need to address before we start the general session, Brandy? Uh, nope. I believe we can uh, start with the rest of it now. All right. Uh, Sam, can we have a reading of petition number one, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, if you are here on the Zoom call or in person for petition number two, 65505 Mulberry Road, that petition has been withdrawn. So if uh, you were here for that, um, thank you for showing up, but you no longer need to be here. Okay, petition number one, please. The petition of Cassandra Reyes seeking the following variance from section 154.070 C1D1A, the maximum height of a fence with an open space percentage of less than or equal to 70% of three feet to six feet for a fence in a minimum front yard. Property located at 24733 Lancer Drive, Portage Township, zoned R, single family district, county. Mr. Reyes, you are, you're on the call, I see. Would you like to add anything to your petition, petition that uh, would be uh, helpful? Um, not necessarily. I, did you have photos? I thought I saw photos at first. Yeah, I was able to forward the, the slides a second ago, and I can't seem to. I don't know if there's anything you need to click over there. Need to click back there we there. go. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you could go to the side of the property, that, that would be <laughs> Uh, so what, from what you can see here, there is a, about an eight or 10 foot high hill uh, from the street to where the house sits. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very steep hill. So we do not plan to put the fence past the trees up there. Um, so there should be no obstruction of vision or anything. So you're gonna orient the fence to the top of the hill then I, I assume, or is it gonna be partially down the hill? I guess it will not be partially say. down the hill whatsoever. It, it's going to be at the top of the hill. Um, it just kind of has to be that way because of how to mow the lawn. It's it's a very steep hill and it's it's quite uh, it, it poses an issue. So that's about what our limit is. It's the wonders of a corner lot as well. So. Yes. Indeed. Okay. Good. Okay. So. Um, it's going to be at the top of the hill, but it will uh, go past the ho house itself, though, correct? Uh, yes, uh, not by too far. I don't think I've measured it out, but it shouldn't go too far. Okay. Uh, it's the, it's the, the line of trees there. They're all on the same line. Um, it won't go past that. So I, we're looking, I think everyone else can see this a little too. We're looking at two kind of pictures. One has a yellow line around it, which I assume is the setbacks. Is that correct? Yes, the property line. The property line, okay. Mm -hmm. And but and then uh, the handwritten drawing, is that where you propose the fence to be? Is that what it boils down to? Yeah, that's the plan. Okay, so it's gonna be all the way out to the road on that? No, not necessarily. Uh, the road, actually, I don't know if you can tell, but uh, it, the whole thing was very confusing, quite honestly. 
but no, it's just gonna go. These pictures are very different, like you know, in comparison. But uh, it's not gonna go past the trees if you look at the picture on the right side. Uh, it that was just the best way for me to draw it, I guess, by hand. Gotcha. Okay, so it's obviously not to scale, and you don't have any footages on there. So, right. But, yeah. So you're yeah. saying that when it extends to the what I believe is going to be the east side of that house, or south side. I'm sorry. Though that tree right there at that corner of the house, it's not going to extend past that tree itself. Uh, that is correct. Okay. And, and not the first tree, but the, I guess it would be the second tree or the tree closest to the house. Understood. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's going to remain in your property. It's going to stay inside the property line. Okay. Inside the property yes. line. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the one picture shows it not near the street. And the other picture shows it right Correct. That yeah, street. that's, yeah. I so a question, a uh, question from Donnie. Uh, why is the fence then being proposed to come all the way up to the front versus just including the rear? Uh, well, it's not necessarily. So I I'm going to repeat that this was kind of difficult to understand everything quite honestly. But uh, so the fence, are we talking about the front of the house? So the, that hasn't exactly been determined yet because of the slope of the, the sides. Um, but yes, we might build up to the front of the house, maybe halfway, unsure yet. Uh, but the limit as to the right side of the house, um, that will be limited by the trees. Yes, uh, the right hand side is what I understand. It's just yep. coming up uh, the front of that fence. Yeah. Um, Would that so terminate right at the, at the back side? Of the rear of the property or of the house uh -huh. or is that coming all the way up basically to the the front fascia of the house um it'll extend pretty much as far as that tree limit on the right side if that's what i'm understanding oh are you talking about all the way on the left no on the right hand side so i understand that's going to be short of the tree line on the right hand side so the the front of the house that faces lancer mm -hmm. Is the fence coming all the way up to that bottom right-hand corner, or is it stopping at the rear corner of the house? It's it might. I'm gonna say the front of the house. It's to be determined, but um, I guess it just depends logistically. Like I said, the, the mowing the lawn makes it kind of difficult because of that steep hill. So um, we're gonna have to like look into that. We were more concerned about the right side of the house. Correct. So why then would you not just consider just fencing off the rear uh it's just the size of the backyard would be much more limited uh i have a large dog she's about 90 pounds um and the fence is mostly con to contain her but uh, uh, being a large dog she she would like a lot of space so it if i, I may i forgot staff uh, staff recommendations we're going to start this off staff you have some Comments on this, please? Yeah, let me kind of do an outline of thoughts and then let's have the petitioner speak again to see. I'll try to outline the way things the application applied for. And then if there's any corrections, then we'll let the petitioner state those corrections. But um, I don't know, uh, at least from inside the room, you should be able to see my green pointer on the map over here. So. This is a road right of way. It shows the street right here, but then there's a space between where the pavement ends and where the property starts. And when you compare that to the aerial, you can see the pavement ends. There's a stretch of grass before the property starts. And so it's a little difficult to see, but there's a slightly blue square right here, which represents the house. And then there's a garage back here as well. Thank you, Sam. And when you're looking at these black lines, these are where the fence is meant to be, with the fence going all the way back to this corner as being shown here. And this is closed off because there's the garage right here. So it's go up to the eastern edge of the garage, leading down to what is the, the, uh, the northwest corner of the house. And ordinarily in this corner lot situation, the area that you could have your fence is kind of, for making it simplified, it's the setback from the front. So we'll say it's in line with 
where this eastern side of the front face of the property is, and then the southern face along Lancer right here. And so the area that could be fenced off under the ordinance is right here. Now the square footage of what could be fenced off right here is not all that different than the square footage over here. It just happens to be that the property owner is interested in having the fence stuff area not include the back side of the garage, but instead include this area over here. And so this area puts all of the, where the issue is for the setbacks. So the, ordinarily the setback would put it right here. And so moving the fence towards the street puts the, it, it up to here, okay? So now we kind of have an idea of where we're talking about. Now, the whole reason why we have these setback limits for fencing and for the height is so we don't end up with whole neighborhoods with six foot tall privacy fences up at, against the edge of where the, pay, where, where the property ends and the right-of-way begins. If someday in the future there's a sidewalk put through here, which I realize there may not be for some time, but the sidewalk is generally put right at the right-of-way line. And so you'd end up with, if you were walking your dog or whatever, you would be right up against a six-foot tall fence. Now, in my neighborhood where I walk, this happens every once in a while, but it's infrequent and it's not for very long, but it does make a less inviting neighborhood. It changes the character of the neighborhood. Everyone else has been having to live with that rule, and whenever they put their fence in, they're not allowed to put a six foot tall privacy fence up at the edge of where a sidewalk would be put if a sidewalk were put in. And if this were allowed here, then you'd have to imagine what would it be like if it were allowed throughout the neighborhood, throughout all of our neighborhoods. And that's why we have this application for a variance which is permission to break a rule that everyone else is following. And so in state law, we have three criteria to measure if this is acceptable or not. And so this will take me to the staff report. Uh, this is Bob Hawley. Why, why are they requesting a six foot fence? What's the purpose for it? it this is to have the, the dogs, uh, which are a little bit larger, to be able to stay without jumping over the fence. Um, but I'll let the petitioner add anything here to clarify that. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct, yes. <laughs> Mike Urbanski here, I have a question on this. Uh, in looking at, at the north, I, I'm assuming that the back of the house faces north. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So the back of the house, the house next to it, to the north of it, has a driveway. The driveway extends beyond the uh, edge of the road. It, it, I know it's not scaled, but just looking at different things, using the garage depth, there's just a guideline. So that area between or the fence is going in, in the edge of the road. I'm sure there's not curbs out there. I did not go out there. Or even looking at the front of the house, the driveway of the said property, there's gotta be more than 10 feet. Am I correct? There, there Does might anybody be. know? There, there might okay. be. Okay, fences are usually put in from the edge of the road. It's usually the back of the curb, again, no. That can be determined here. From the back of the curb, there's a uh, five-foot parkway and then a five-foot fence. So from the edge of the road, it comes in 10 feet. And it's my indication by looking at the photo, again, uh, if you look at the, uh, not the picture, but the other one, it, it's even harder yet because it's smaller. But if that's over 10 feet, Okay, it's gonna be 10 feet to the fence. If it's over 10 feet, whether that's five foot or 10 foot more, uh, therefore that will not be right at the edge of the road. The fence will not be right at the sidewalk. 
the, excuse me. If I understand your question correctly, the right of way here includes not just the space where the road is paved for the vehicles, but it I understand that additional space so that if a sidewalk were put in in the future, which is what we have to plan for here, and that's, that's why, why the I just explained. I just explained that the, if a sidewalk is put in, it's put in. 10 foot from the, or a total of 10 foot, five foot from the back to the curb to the sidewalk, and the sidewalk is five foot. So from the edge of the road, and again, they got to determine exactly where the edge of the road is, where the curb would be. It's a total of 10 feet. As I said, it appears to be more, it appears to be closer to 20 feet. So therefore, if a sidewalk is put in, it will be not, it not it will not be next to the fence. It'll be at least five plus feet to it. So yes, I understand what you're saying. I understand the code, but also I understand what I just described about the uh, sidewalk. It it is. I cannot quote what the county standard is for sidewalk location, but in other jurisdictions I, I just, where I've worked, the sidewalk has been up against the property line. Abby was okay. uh, director. No, no it's not. Ex excuse me. I built many, many houses in the city and county. And that what I just described is what I've gone by in St. Joe County, Indiana, and the city of Mishawaka, and the city of South Bend, and the city of Mishawaka. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll be quiet. Oh, no, you're fine, Mr. Urbanski. This is Abby Wiles, director. Uh, yes, what Mr. Urbanski is saying is correct. There's additional right of way. I mean, there's right, and like had Ryan explained, uh, we don't know what it is exactly here, um, whether it's 50 or 60 feet, but say it's 50 feet or 60 feet, you know, it would be 25 feet or 30 feet from the center line center measured line, right. back, right. right? So no, it wouldn't be right up against the street. It would be set back a little bit. Correct, but so I, it'll be set back a little bit, but again, just just basically use the garage, which uh, which is set quite a ways back, but that thing's going to be at least 20 foot, and use that as a scale and look over the side where the, you can see the edge of the road to the property line, and so that's why I come up with the fact that it's in excess of 10 feet, uh, so... I guess the other thing that I guess I want to clarify with the petitioner and I guess staff is they're asking for a six foot fence instead of three foot and then an, instead of having the open space requirement um, of equal or less to 70% they want a full solid one but there's no mention of a setback variance on this so that's because they're not asking for a setback variance they're going up to where they're allowed to is that all they're is that what they're limited to then whatever the setback variant or setback is is where they would have to go correct if that's they were correct so the request today is for a height variance a height variance and in ryan's ad uh staff report in providing you know justification for not granting the height variance he was saying the idea is that you wouldn't want six foot privacy fences up along the property on that line. Side of the road, right? Yeah, and um, the m not material, but the opaqueness is part of our zoning ordinance. It can be uh, basically solid and not transparent if it meets the height requirements, but as it gets taller, it has to be open. That is one thing, Mike Urbanski, that is one thing that I'm against, okay? but saying the fence would be right up against the sidewalk is what I was discussing. Yes, I truly believe that we do not need a solid fence along the roadway. And I think the people would not want it for the for safety reasons too. Should we move back to the picture previous? Uh, this is Bob Hawley. Uh, I have a question or a comment. Uh, is this fence going to be installed by a professional company? Am I allowed to answer the question? Yeah, he's asking you. Yes, Ms. Ray. Okay. Yeah, um, so it's undetermined yet. We haven't really been able to do anything with anyone because of this whole issue. Because uh, we can't, 
at this point, we are unable to determine where the fence can be. Uh, honestly, this process, we've been doing it since November and it's been very complicated and hard to understand. But uh, so it's possible. Um, so you, you may or may not hire it out. I'm sorry? You may or may not have a contractor do it for you. Yeah, pretty much. We we haven't been able to make any definite decisions because we don't know where it could lie. Um, we did call one company out and they said get a variance first before we start really discussing it. So. Okay. And you understand, ma'am, that the variance was for the for the height and for the fact that it's a solid fence. Uh, I think you have. I if I may just finish and you can answer it all together. You have so many unknowns, and you're getting some of that information back now, or it needs to be in how. I think that you need to table it till the uh, February meeting and take care of all the things that you're not sure about now, since you, 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 know, you know the fact that I think you have most questions answered. And if not, a trip across the street to the building department will verify exactly the questions you have on it also, okay? I'm done. Um, I, I actually have to agree with Mr. Bansky. It's without knowing how far the fence is gonna be from the road and how far the fence is gonna be from the house and how far to the front of the house the fence is gonna extend, it, that, would, that would make a determination of where my vote would be. So without having those, that data, um, I, I would I would recommend that you request a tabling if I can do that to get exact dimensions on where this fence is going to go, whether that's a hand drawn, you know, right now we're voting on some things that we don't know. I mean, we don't know where this is going to end up. So until we know exactly where it's going to end, I would also be inclined to say table it personally. So, um, Mark. I keep hearing that this is a solid fence. We're actually looking to do probably a chain link, a black chain link fence. Uh, so if that's a concern, uh, as I said, we're planning on only building it out to the trees. The trees, um, you can't really tell in this picture, but it's about twice the distance of where that line is drawn. So if that's 10 feet, I'd say approximately 20 feet, um, from the street. Uh, and yeah, then I appreciate that, but I'm, I guess what I'm trying to guide you towards is if, if you were to ask for a vote on what you're requesting today, my feeling is you're likely going to get denied the variance, which is gonna require you to wait at least six months to come back and request it again. If you were to table it and put together dimensions for the board that would be more exact and show where these are gonna be at and what kind of fence it's going to be, whether it's gonna be at least a little opaque or what it's gonna be, next month you'll stand a better chance of having um, your variance viewed more favorably. Ma'am, if I can add, how long have you lived in the house? Uh, we, I was just purchased in September. Okay. In your closing packet that you got from the title company, there normally is a copy of the survey of the house. The survey would have all the dimensions that we are asking for. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we were told that the survey was not sufficient enough to base a fence off of, and the one that would be uh, would cost us around two thousand dollars. So that is another roadblock that we've hit because we're already spending so much time just trying to build the fence. Well, it may not have been sufficient enough for I'm I'm not sure you talked to, but for this board, if you were to if you were to supply us something that showed off of the house, it's going to extend out 10 feet and then another 60 feet and all that. Um, that would give us a better insight as what you're asking for and where it's going to lie versus the drawings that you have, have already said is not to scale. So that would be definitely beneficial. Mike suggests, and I, I believe is probably a great way to go mm -hmm. for this board. Again, I don't know who you talked to about that. It might have been the building department. might have been It might have even been staff here, but for the board, that would be helpful and sufficient enough for us to be able to make a better informed decision on this request. Okay, I guess they don't really have a choice. Or you build a fence that doesn't require variances and you don't even have to come back for us again again. Not really. I, I wanna 
add a moment of clarification here. Uh, how the staff prepared its report is based off from what was in the petition. Right. And it answered questions such as, is the fence gonna be built by professionals? And in question 2A, it says the fence will be built by professionals. And so when you are representing your petition, if you represent something different than what your application does in writing, it casts doubt. So we don't know if what is written is correct or what is represented is correct. Well, what do you mean by built by professionals? Like, because I'm not building the fence, I'm gonna hire somebody to do it. Right, that's what we're talking about. Okay. A, a licensed contractor to you know in the city of South Bend or or St. Joe County, I guess is then, the question. Then yes, it will. Yeah. So Abby, again, just want to note that if this request were to be tabled, we can reach out to Ms. Reyes and uh, work with her on developing a more detailed site sketch of exactly where the fence is going to go, the dimensions from the house going out toward uh, East. East Lake or. Uh, Easily, Easily thank you. Um, and then we can look at what the approximate right of way is and help, um, I guess, provide a little more technical assistance in her pre preparing the application. And if, if the board is really united in wanting more information, it can on its own motion, if somebody is to make that motion and it gets seconded and voted on, can continue it to the next meeting. So we normally have to have the request from the homeowner, at least that's how it's always been in the past. I am not sure I didn't look at the current current uh, rules but that the homeowner had to initiate it because we'd always ask the homeowner, do you want a table to the February meeting? Well, she's our lawyer, so I'm I done. suppose if she says that it's okay. Pardon? I said she's I'm sorry, our lawyer, I so if she says it's okay, it's probably okay to make a motion. I didn't realize there was a lawyer there. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, so, Ms. Reyes, would you would you like to petition or table this until February to uh, get more information and work with staff on uh, creating a uh, site plan that uh, the board would be uh, more advantageous towards? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Do we still have to make a motion, Brandy? Uh, if she's asking to have it tabled, uh, you do not. The motion and voting would be if the board wanted to do it itself. Okay. So 24733 petition number one, Lancer, or Lancer Drive, has been tabled until the February meeting, which will be February... Second Wednesday. Whatever the second Wednesday in February is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you for your time. I appreciate that. I know I understand this is uh, your maybe your first time dealing with a government agency, but un unfortunately, we're seven people that need a little more information. So, thank you, and we'll see you again next month. Can I leave? Okay. Can we have the reading of petition number three, please? The petition of John Glenn School Building Corp. seeking a special exception use for institutional uses under section 4.03 to allow a solar energy system, SES, property located at 400 School Drive, Liberty Township, zoned R1, single family residential, North Liberty. Do we have the petitioner online anywhere? Uh, could, oh. could, could we provide the staff report? Yeah, yep. Um, staff, did you have uh, your insights on this please, right? So this is an application for the town of uh, North Liberty. So we are following their ordinance. So when I make reference to it, that, that's where I'm referring to. And the town zoning ordinance does outline several criteria for a special use permit. Ultimately, we will need to have a recommendation from the board to recommend either favorably or unfavorably to the town of North Liberty's town council. And this comes to you with a favorable recommendation from staff. And from that, we looked at the criteria in the code book. For example, the um, topography, uh, the city or the county uh, topography layer was checked. There's no topographical issues, fresh water, uh, forested scrubs, 
uh, wetlands exist on the eastern edge of the property, but not where the solar energy system project area is located. There's no other natural features to note. Uh, the property is surrounded by, is and is surrounded by a uh, property that's zoned R1 single family district. Um, moving on to the driveway location and street access, uh, these uh, solar energy systems do not generate heavy traffic and so there should not be any no issues of note there. The on-site and off-site accommodations for vehicular and pedestrian circulation patterns. There is a planned trail to the east of the proposed solar energy system along the rear of the property, which is shown on the site plan. Additionally, uh, the current on-site and off-site accommodations for vehicular and pedestrian circulation patterns are sufficient to meet the needs of the solar energy system. Criteria five is the amount and location and design of parking areas and loading areas. Uh, the proposed use is accessory to a school. No additional parking or loading areas are needed. Uh, criteria six, building character, including height, intensity, materials, and architecture. And uh, the proposed solar energy system um, is not a building, so it will not the building criteria will not really apply, but the proposed solar energy system um, will not exceed the maximum height and will meet the other criteria for the zoning ordinance regardless. The structures will be located on a large parcel behind the existing school building and there will be uh, substantial setbacks to the property lines creating a buffer to the adjacent land uses for Criteria seven, landscaping, screening, and buffering of adjacent properties. Um, just to, to restate that this is substantially set back and uh, already landscaped. And then moving on, the compatibility of the uh, proposed use site design and architecture with the district in which the use is proposed to be located. The proposed site plan shows compatibility with the proposed use, site design and architecture, or the school located in the R1 district. Criteria nine, the extent to which the proposed use, site design and architecture comply with the regulations and development standards that would be applicable if the site were zoned to an office buffer district, commercial district, or industrial district of this ordinance, which would permit the proposed use as a primary use. For institutional uses as listed as a primary use in the commercial and industrial district, that is okay. For the industrial, I'm sorry, the institutional use is a listed special exception use in the office buffer district, so that's okay. The proposed solar energy system site design would meet the development standards that would be applicable if the site were zoned to the office buffer district, commercial district, or industrial district of the ordinance, so that's okay. And because the solar energy system does not count as a building, the architectural standards do not apply. Under criteria 10, open space and other site amenities, which the school does offer plenty of open space and site amenities. Criteria 11, availability and adequacy of streets, sanitary facilities, potable water, storm water management systems, and other utilities. The existing streets, sanitary facilities, potable water, storm water management systems, and other utilities are available and appear to be adequate to the needs of the proposed solar energy system. And then moving on to the uh, four criteria that are found in state law. Again, staff recommends approval of the special exception use. And in those four criteria, uh, the proposed use is not judged to be injurious to the public health, safety, comfort, community, moral standards, convenience, or general welfare. Solar energy systems do not generate hazardous or objectionable elements such as noise, odor, dust, smoke, or glare. 
nor do they generate heavy traffic or drain community and utility resources. The proposed special use will not injure or adversely affect the use of the adjacent area or properties therein. Allowing solar energy systems is consistent with the adjacent area and does not introduce an injurious element and does not adversely affect the area. Criteria three, the proposed use will be consistent with the character and the district in which it's located and the land use authorized therein. The solar energy system will be part of the John Glenn School Corporation's curriculum. And there's an attachment, this is the education plan for solar energy, uh, so I'm sorry, solar project, and that's included in the packet, thereby serving the institutional use per the education, per the special exception use list in the R1 single family district. And point four, the proposed use is compatible with the recommendations of the comprehensive plan of the town of North Liberty, especially in section 5.3, policies for schools, public and government services, goal A, continue to partner with the school corporation and their effort to provide a quality educational experience and for this, I'm noting the other attachment, which is an agreement approving institutional use, which is an attachment dated December 7th, 2020. Um, uh, petitioners are here with their presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions, but as I've outlined, they've met all of the criteria in the law and in the code book. And uh, like I said, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll come back to that because I'd like to know what does constitute a building on a, on a lot, but we'll come back to that. A building has to have a roof. Oh, okay. For the town of New Car, I'm sorry, North Liberty's code book, it does have to have a roof. Have a roof. And there's no roofs on a solar panel. So there's that's not. Good. And that's just an important distinction to make between uh, North Liberty's and versus other zoning ordinances. Gotcha, because they could, they could differ. Correct. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Good question. Uh, hello, my name is Christopher Winchell. I'm superintendent of John Glenn Schools. I also have with me Brendan Bleakey of JMS Solutions, who is our contractor. And I just want to thank the Town and North Liberty Board for their time and effort and energy in supporting this to come to your board. And I appreciate this board and, and the staff's time and effort and energy in reviewing it and providing these details. It's, it's extremely thorough. So I don't necessarily have additional presentation or information to share other than to be here to answer questions if there's any questions on what's already been submitted and and I would just note that this green energy curriculum project is right in line with the other stellar improvements that the town of North Liberty has been making over the years and so we just want to continue our partnership with them and provide the best experience for our kids. Very good. Board any questions for Petitioner? Everybody's muted, so it must not be. <laughs> um, so who's going to be enjoying the, the benefits of the solar panels? The school itself or the whole town's going to going to get uh, access to it? Well, basically, we'll be producing from that field a little bit less than a half a megawatt of electricity. That provides about 90% of what is being used at the school. Wow. And so... We're, we are working on what's called an interconnection agreement with NIPSCO. It's, it's obviously pending the approval, but we'll basically produce that energy for NIPSCO as a, as a source of green energy. We'll be able to use what's produced, and then obviously we still have to pay for what's not produced. But then the, the big part besides that is to be able to provide some additional curriculum at our school and you may not be, you're probably not ultra familiar with the direction that the Department of Education's gone, but there's been a big push to provide kids what are called graduation pathways. And, and really what they are is their vocational tracks that kids get on in the school and then can get into employment uh, right out of high school to be an additional opportunity to the traditional fine arts curriculum of going to a four year university. And so because of our healthy agriculture program and then the opportunity of this solar project on that campus, it's going to immediately give our 
high schoolers additional graduation pathways in agri-science, renewable energy, green energy. And then we also have a hope down the road, a dream of mine is to expand our already strong 9 through 12 agriculture program into a, a K through 12 or a 3 through 12 agri-science. And we already have on this campus what's known as an outdoor lab. Um, and I have a hope that we can expand our outdoor lab and maybe have a small crop on the campus, maybe have a, a small chicken coop of sorts, something like that that would be age appropriate, but also interweave it with this green energy project. So that's really, obviously there's some operational expenses that we can save and reconstitute the student programming, and it's all intertwined with those hopes of curriculum. Any other questions from the board? Uh, this is Bob Hawley. Uh, question to, is it Christopher? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, just a point of clarification, because you did mention NIPSCO. I think you mentioned that. And um, in your area, NIPSCO does provide electricity as well as gas? Yes, sir. In the town of North Liberty, they provide both the electric and the gas. Okay, I just uh, clarifying that because, uh, you know, in our area, NIPSCO is no noted basically for gaps only. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions from the board? I have a question for staff. If that's okay. Sure, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is Donnie Ritzma. Uh, we're looking over the, uh, the site plan that's proposed. What, for the consideration of the landscape materials, uh, what is being, is there any landscape materials being placed around the solar field? So we need your name and address for the, for the records, okay. please. Hello, my name is Brendan Blakey with Johnson Metal Solutions. Um, address is uh, five nine. 64 Stockburger Place. Um, so in the site plan that is attached, the, da, 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 sorry, it's pretty small. Welcome to our world. <laughs> it will be grass uh, below and we have a landscape contractor that will be also providing the, a, the seed and a straw mat. So it will, essentially be redone uh, to match its existing purpose. So the ground cover would only just be uh, grass. So there's no, uh, I guess, just uh, thoughts for using like low ground covered native vegetation, such as flowers or anything like that, just to uh, spruce the appeal. Uh, Cause I know there might be some connotation with, you know, just having an open solar field next to a trail school I mean it's set far back away from the right away but um, just it's just a thought of using uh, more of uniquely native vegetation this is Christopher Winchell again John Glenn superintendent um, that's an excellent idea and it's our hope that again this connection with the agri science program and we have what's called a landscaping course high school credited course it's our hope that the landscape course will use this as an additional project. Um, but we went ahead with just the normal grass, mm -hmm. obviously for cost and things of, of, you know, getting the project out to bid, et cetera. But appreciate your input there. And it's certainly part of the overall grand scheme of things to have that spruced up and beautified as you referred to it through, yeah. through the work of the students though. I wanna emphasize that. And Donnie, just, uh, just to clarify, um, so I know MACOG was involved, uh, I believe Leah still. That's with, where I was going with this. Yep, yep. I figured as much uh, with some of the proposed or some of the landscape requirements that were integrated in the St. Joe County zoning ordinance when we updated our or ordinance for unincorporated areas for solar. That pollinator friendly uh, landscaping requirements was, I don't believe has been adopted in the North Liberty Town zoning yeah, ordinance? The guys are shaking their heads to confirm for me. So there's standards that be met in the county, but in the city of North Liberty, they don't have standards at, at this point. Correct. Well, that's why I was questioning for the, the staff looking at the, the town's uh, perimeter yard landscaping uh, requirements. That's why I just wanted 
more clarification knowing about this pollinator garden idea and uh, the considerations for that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, thank you for bringing that up. We'd certainly be willing to give that, you know, hands-on attention if, if I could be educated a little bit more about um, what the, the St. Joe County um, expectations or what the desire is, we certainly would tend to that. It, but my request would be that we could tend to it with the students through the, through the landscaping class if that would be acceptable. Yeah, right at this point, town of North Liberty doesn't require those standards, so you don't have to meet them, but we're just suggesting you that you try. Correct. And North Liberty may eventually get there, but for this purpose, you don't have to worry about it at the moment, correct? Yeah, so what correct. we could do is share our um, zoning ordinance, not that you're bound by it, but <laughs> what is you know required in unincorporated St. Joe County is kind of like a resource for pollinator-friendly sure. landscaping. That'd be excellent. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the board or staff? All right. With that, the public portion is now open. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of or have questions about this petition? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to? Seeing and hearing none, the public portion is now closed. I would entertain a motion for uh, to send this through with a, either a favorable, unfavorable, or no recommendation to the Town of North Liberty's Council, correct? Or is there any additional questions from the board? The questions I have don't relate to what we're doing. Well, then you have to worry about it. <laughs> Bob Holly here, I would uh, make a motion that we send it uh, with a favorable recommendation. This is Donnie Ritzma, and I will second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Sam, would you call for the vote, please? Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Ms. Deutscher? Yes. Mr. Urbanski? off of the call for a second. Mike, you there? Is it down here? And it just shows the phone. There's a ah, technology. Automation. I would we have enough members to be able to make a vote one way or another, so yeah. Mr. Hawley? Yes. Mr. Ritzima? Yes. Mr. Feldman? Yes. Based on the testimony presented here today, the special exemption is being forwarded on to the town of North Liberty with a favorable recommendation. Good luck. Uh, thank you for uh, investment. Appreciate it. Thank you. I can't believe that was easier on a fence. Anyway, um, <laughs> can we have the reading of petition number four, please? The petition of Chris and Tina Denig seeking the following variants from section 154.070A3, the provision requiring establishment of a primary use prior to construction of an accessory building to allow a pole barn to be constructed on a vacant lot prior to construction of a dwelling. Property located on the south side of Johnson Road, approximately 750 feet east of the intersection of Johnson Road and Lilac Road. Center Township zoned R, single family district county. Yes, staff, comments? Yes, Sean Klein, Area Plan Commission. The staff would recommend approval of the variance on the condition that a single family dwelling be constructed on the property within three years time of the variance being granted. Um, we arrived at this um, recommendation after assessing the three criteria of state law. We feel that the approval would not be injurious to public health, safety, morals, and general welfare, um, mainly based on the three year deadline. This is going to protect against abuse um, wherein it they um, would end up ultimately using the accessory structure for a non-residential purpose. And really that's one of the main justifications for not allowing an accessory structure built pri uh, prior to a dwelling. So that's been addressed here. Um, we also find that the use and value of the area adjacent to the property included in the variance will not be substantially affected. Uh, mainly because it will still need to meet the development standards of the residential district with regard to height and setbacks. 
And once again, um, within three years, it'll be returned to a condition that um, could have been accomplished without a variance, either with a dwelling unit on the property or with the accessory unit having been removed. Um, we also find that strict application of the terms of this chapter would not allow the petitioner to safely store personal property on the parcel while they finalize construction plans for the house. So we feel that this would be a practical difficulty for the property owner. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, we can't do that. I just want to make sure. No, Sam might be able to. Sam, hey, would you mind clicking <laughs> to the next slide? No. I think oh. you have to, Wait. every time you now click it is. out of the PowerPoint, I think you gotta click back into the PowerPoint to be able to click it through. I, I guess the question I had was, so the three-year commitment, is that something that we have to put into our um, vote, or is that something since it's in record is gonna be automatically there? I forget, we did it last time. And it, it's on the record. I mean, it'll be in the findings of fact that you impose the condition, so okay. we'll be good. They would have to actually include that in their motion for that to be the case. Okay, all right. And in terms of enforcement, Sean, uh, let me know that you are keeping a record of these as we do them. I am. There was a question about that last month. Um, we actually only had two in 2020. It felt like a lot more, but um, I have started a record. And um, once the, the timeline lapses, we will um, go out and inspect and ensure that there is a house on the property. Okay. Excellent. And if there's not? Then we will use the full force of the zoning ordinance to get the accessory structure removed in a timely manner. Oh, there you go. I didn't know. <laughs> I, well, I didn't know. Yeah, what's the enforcement? Okay, um, petitioner, the, um, Mr. And Mrs. Denig, would you have anything to add to your petition? No, oh, it's pretty cut and dry. Understood. Okay. Any questions for the petitioner from the board or staff at this time? This is Christine Deutscher. Does a three-year deadline seem doable for you all? I don't know what your timeline looks like. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yes. Yep. Yes, we plan on this year coming up being built. So a three-month timeline be okay. That's, uh, no, uh, don't listen. Don't go do that. Never mind. Okay, that's fine. Just try. Okay. Okay. Any additional questions from the board? Okay. I don't think so. We're not the Thank board. you. With that, the public portion is now open. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of or have questions about this petition? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to? Seeing none, the public portion is now closed. Um, any additional comments, questions from the board, or I'll entertain a motion? You can make the motion. Well, that's all right. I guess I will then. This is Sid Schaefer. I'll make a motion that we'll accept this as proposed. With the three year deadline. With the three year deadline. Bob only, I will second that. We appreciate you. All right. Well, we have a motion and a second. Sam, can we have the uh, calling the vote, please? Mr. Ritzima. Yes. Ms. Deutscher. Yes. Mr. Hawley. Yes. Mr. Schaefer. Yes. Mr. Urbanski. Mr. Villeman. Yes. Based off the testimony presented here today, uh, the Area Board of Zoning Appeals has approved this uh, request as petitioned and will issue it in findings of the facts. Thank you for your time. Good luck Thank on your you. build. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. You too. You too. Sam, can we have the reading of petition number five, please? The petition of Thomas E. and Karen L. McCormick seeking the following variances. One from section 154.092A, the minimum required lot area of 20 acres to 17.32 acres for lot one of a proposed subdivision. Two, from section 154.092A, the minimum required lot area of 20 acres to 0.77 acres for lot two of a proposed subdivision. And three, from section 154.092D, the minimum required rear setback of 30 feet to 10 feet for an existing barn on proposed lot two. Property located at 66488 Sycamore and 66224 Sycamore Road, Liberty Township, Zoned A, Agricultural District, County. Staff has some comments on this petition? We do. This is Sean Klein, Area Plan Commission. So essentially what the applicant is hoping to accomplish here is to um, 
shift the property lines between these two existing parcels so that um, there's a property line that's narrow around the um, northern house, around the lawn area there, and then that sliver of tilled land will be joined to the lot to the south. Um, the staff recommends approval of these variances um, based on the criteria from state law. We find that it would not be injurious to public health, safety, morals, and general welfare, uh, mainly because there's already a house on both parcels, so we're not increasing uh, the number of buildable lots in the agricultural district. Therefore, we're not um, furthering um, residential sprawl in the ag district and um, not undermining uh, the productive use of farmland. Um, also, the existing parcel is effectively only useful for residential use as it is, so um, we feel like tailoring the lot line more to just encompass that residential use will not be detrimental to general welfare. Similarly, we feel like the use and value of the area adjacent to the property will not be affected in a substantially adverse manner. The variance really isn't going to change any conditions with regard to properties that are outside the ultimate subdivision. Um, there is the issue of the, the setback variance that comes into play with this existing barn to the north. Um, which will have it a little bit closer to the neighboring property than is ideal, but we feel like um, allowing the cultivated farmland to be placed on one parcel and the benefits to the value of that land therefore outweigh this, um, the setback from 30 to 10 feet. We also feel that strict application of the terms of the zoning ordinance would result in practical difficulties in the use of the property as it would not permit a subdivision of land which allows the petitioner to retain the productive farmland, which is currently contained in two separate parcels, um, while also enhancing the marketability and therefore the value of the smaller residentially used portion. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. I think you summed up pretty well. All right. Uh, Mr. Lang, are you a part of this petition? Uh, yes, I am. It's Terry Lang from Lang, Feeney & Associates. Our address is 715 South Michigan Street in South Bend represent the petitioner here, uh, Thomas and Karen McCormick. The McCormick's own both parcels and reconfiguring the line will allow the agricultural portion of the triangular shaped parcel to be added to their existing home, which is the Southern parcel. Um, with this, we're creating a, a one acre parcel around the existing house and barn on the triangular area. So basically what is tilled will continue to be tilled and what is yard area will be the new lot two that we're creating there. Right. Are they the ones still in it, Mr. Lang? Um, Mr. McCormick lives on lot two and his father owns the property to the north um, and it's listed as they're both Thomas. So um, all of that area is farmed between the two of them. Any questions for the petitioner from board? Yes, sir. I'm Tom McCormick or Thomas E. McCormick. Oh, uh, also the petitioner. Petitioner property, you know, the property owner. Uh, you guys have done a wonderful job spelling all this out and Terry, he's got it spelled out just here. Um, hoping for support of, as Terry's requested for us. Um, as you mentioned, yes, it is tillable through there. Um, and we're just trying to make this more so we can continue in the future to maintain that as agricultural land through there. We always like. Thank you very much. Any questions for the board from the petitioners? I just wondered why you made the lot so small. Yeah, I was going to say you're down to one acre. And that and that was the the thought process on that because the property line to we'll call it the north. That was already set set in place because of dad's property comes up against that. The, to the south, that was the, and that picture is kind of not the best to show, but when you see the, the aerial of the grass, that is the existing where that little jog is. That is the existing corner post that was there in the beginning. That picture really doesn't show it. There you go. 
you can kind of see in the where the yard ends, you'll see a corner post there. That corner post is still established, and that's always been the property line between, we'll call it where my house is and where this one acre piece is. So when we measured all that off, essentially it came to a one acre piece. And for most individual homeowners, and it still allows with the big yard mm -hmm. to the south, it still allows a second future septic field if needed. It's got a brand new septic system in it, um, but it allows for the septic second septic system plus it allows a beautiful large yard for frolicking for frolicking yeah so um that's kind of why we did it there you laid go. out for what we did and here it says 0.77 so there's a discrepancy yeah. on on what was petitioned and what it actually was because of the railroad set we talked about that oh okay so that's there's correct. a slight difference between what was petitioned and what the actual acreage is right correct oh, yeah. okay. uh, terry i don't know if you'd like to speak to that or uh, yes, after we filed the petition, uh, it came, Mr. McCormick found the record document from the railroad that relinquished the railroad's rights to the adjacent property owners. So in fact, the area for the south half of that right of way will be included with the proposed lot one that Mr. McCormick uh, has where his home is currently located. So with that documentation, we've increased the acreage for lot one and uh, the petition did not need to be re-advertised because of that. Oh, so he's able to do a clawback. Already did apparently, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. so. I was wondering how that, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Any additional questions from the board? So just to clarify, the original intent is to continue to till what is being tilled. There's no new construction being proposed. Correct, yes, continue to farm, no additional construction. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. With that, the public portion is now open. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of or have questions about this petition? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to? Seeing and hearing none, the public portion is now closed. Board, I will entertain a motion or have any additional questions or comments. I make a motion that we accept the proposal as read. Bob Hawley seconds that motion. We have a motion and a second. Sam, would you call for the vote, please? Ms. Deutscher? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Ritzema? Yes. Mr. Hawley? Yes. Mr. Urbanski? Mr. Vellman? Yes, based on the testimony presented here today, the Area Board of Zoning Appeals uh, has, has uh, granted the variances as requested and will issue in findings of the facts. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your patience. Thank you. Sam, we have the reading of petition number six, please. The petition of Michael J. and Susan D. Engel seeking the following variance from section 154.092A, the minimum required lot area of 20 acres to five acres for lot one of a proposed subdivision. Property located at 67751 Oak Road and 67729 Oak Road. Liberty Township zoned A, Agricultural District County. Mr. Lang. This is Terry Lang from Lang Feeney and Associates. Our address is 715 South Michigan Street. South Bend, I represent the petitioner here, Michael and Susan Engel. Um, there are, are currently two parcels, and if the staff could advance to the diagram that was submitted, um, the Engels have two parcels. Um, and what you'll see is um, the green area for where the house is located extends to the north onto the second parcel that's owned. The total acreage for the parcels here amounts to about 17 acres. And what they're doing is a little estate planning right here. In that area north of the red line is where the septic system is located for the home. And what they would like to do is reconfigure it in a fashion so that the septic system would be on that parcel for the future and forever, as you see on that diagram right there. The balance of the property then would be an outlot. The house parcel for the home and, and large garage building that's there would be a five acre parcel. So that if anybody would in the future, if something would happen to the angles, 
they would be able to sell the house separately from the ag ground. And this way it would be protected as ag ground also creating it as an outlaw with our future subdivision that's being done. So it gives a couple of options to them in their estate planning for the future with regards to the home and the agricultural property. They've lived out there for over 40 years and are adamant that the balance of the property should remain agricultural. And that's why we've created as an outlaw. We always appreciate that opportunity. Staff Advertising question for the staff. The petition has, looks like three variance requests, but the agenda only has one. That's correct. Um, we recently uh, revised the subdivision ordinance such that um, out lots no longer require variances from the acreage or the frontage requirements of the zoning ordinance. Um, essentially, they're no longer treated as lots. Therefore, that variance was not needed. Okay. What else would you like to add? <laughs> Uh, I wanted to clarify for the new members of the board, um, when we refer to an out lot that's essentially a non-buildable lot, um, a building permit could never be issued for this lot after the subdivision goes through. Um, therefore, it's kind of left with few other uses other than to continue to be cultivated. So um, in situations like this where they want to break off the residential area, we typically will allow that as long as the um, tilled acreage remains in an outlot, um, thereby they're not creating an additional buildable lot in the agricultural district. So it has the benefit of not leading to any additional residential sprawl while protecting that agricultural acreage for additional agricultural use. Very good. Any questions from the board for Mr. Lang? Thank you, Mr. Lang. With that, the public portion is now open. Any wish, anyone wishing to speak in favor of or have questions about this petition? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to this petition? Seeing none, the public portion is now closed. Any additional comments, questions, or I'll entertain a motion. Bob Hawley here. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the variances for 67, 751, and 67 729 Oak Road, North Liberty, Indiana. This is Donnie Ritzman, I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Would you call for the vote, please, Sam? Mr. Schaefer. Yes. Ms. Deutscher. Yes. Mr. Hawley. Yes. Mr. Ritzima. Yes. Mr. Bellman. Yes. Based on the testimony presented here today, uh, the Area Board of Zoning Appeals has uh, approved the variances as requested and uh, will issue written findings of the facts. Thank you, Mr. Lang. You, when you do out lots, you make our lives very easy. So uh, we Thank appreciate you. that. All right. Um, we are done with the petitions. <clears throat> I have in my possession finding of the facts from the December. Let me get to them. What was that day? December 2nd, 2020. Um, I entertain a motion and a second to approve the finding of the facts. I think you had to be here. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the finding of the facts for the December 2nd, 2020 meeting. A motion. Brandy, can the new members vote on the findings of fact? Uh, yes, they are allowed to vote on the findings of fact and the minutes under Robert's rules. Oh, cool. Thank you. You want one a second? <laughs> sure, I'll second it, Sid Schaefer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I also have in my possession uh, the minutes from Aye. the December 2nd meeting. Um, entertain a motion to approve those minutes as written. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as written. <laughs> Is there a second? Is there a second? I guess I get to second. Um, all the seconds. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Motion and a second. Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Aye. Mr. Holly, you keep 
popping in and out with, um, we hear you, but you sometimes don't uh, appear on screen. I always want to see your face. I think it's the internet. Oh, <laughs> well, we were having problems. Uh, any additional business anyone need to discuss? Any additional business anyone need to discuss? I just want to discuss one thing. Yes, sir. I can't disagree because I was told we can't disagree say no about that. But the last one we did. Yeah. The last one we did. And I probably ought to take it up with Mr. Lane. Probably ought to take, take it up with the property Lane, owners. When you land like a piece of land. You land like a piece of land. On the last one? On the, the last one. Nothing's being landlocked. It's, it's landlocked. landlocked. According to the county tax code, you'll get a separate tax parcel for that parcel. That parcel is separate now. Yeah. Yeah, that 12 acres that's behind the house. It has no road access. Yeah, it does. It has road it access. Does. Yeah, it's going to be right there. It's there. Yeah, that whole side right there. They're that not just. They're not that. just cutting no, no, it off I'm from the lens. Right, it goes all the way to the road. They're only sectioning no, no, off the no. green section. No, no, no. The red section. line divides the two properties. That's the that's the current property line. They're going to eliminate that. Yeah, yeah. they're only sectioning out the green section of right. the houses. They're sectioning out the green section. But there's a road still there. But that'll remain. Yeah. The, and that property, remain. that one property line won't remain. The red one that you're right, seeing the there. Away, the new property lines so it's going to be the, the residential area, and then the rest of it is all going outline. to be one outlet. That will get changed. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yep. And I understood before yep. that understood would not before. get changed. That okay, yeah, they're going to do that through the subdivision. Okay, yeah, I can show you a property that, I can show you a that's property in a trust that, that I'm dealing with. In the trust that I'm dealing with. That there's a property similar to that. that there's property similar that to that. That line never got changed. That I've line never got it's changed. Two, it it's two I've separate read. properties yeah. yet, and there's one that's landlocked. Well, then they did it wrong back then, but this time, <laughs> the, way, you know, the way they wrote it, when Terry wrote it, he wrote it to section that out, and then the new 12 acres was going to be its own one lot. That was kind of the way I took it. Yes. It, it, it doesn't show it that way in the No, picture. it doesn't. doesn't yeah. That no, it doesn't. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that could be a Terry issue. If you want to take yeah. that up, Mr. Lang, <laughs> you're more than welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's all> right. <laughs> Although, um, <laughs> since you are correct that that has been done in past approvals. Right. Yes, we, we have. Had, I think we did it. that last year, as a matter of fact. Yeah. One of the ones. Remember, was, I was complaining about right. it. You're correct, yeah, that is landline, yeah, <laughs> I, I understand. Yeah, I mean, there is, and we was told it was none of our business to determine that well, stuff. It's, <laughs> no one ever said that. <laughs> well, it's no different than no different that. than the school thing. <laughs> There's no requirement that an outlaw has frontage, right. but if, no, you, if it makes you uncomfortable, you can definitely consider that. Right. It's kind of like the school thing. I look at it, I get it, it's a good educational thing. I get it, it's good education. But is it really a good use for school money? But is it really a good use for school money? I'm, but that's not our decision. I'm guessing they're probably well, not, not using money to get it with that third party. A lot of times they'll build it and then you pay them back with the savings. Well, you still right, yeah. but the savings should offset still, what they what, right, what the they pay out. But usually the schools they, make out. Well, I know I've seen a couple of them. I've yeah, talked to people that got them, and usually it don't work yeah. near as good as they try to tell yeah. them. It, does. it usually doesn't. But then there's also it like these like back clauses. Also, they can say if we don't say what you promise, you're going to pay us too. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, usually when it works out, the the only gain is the guys get the tax advantage. The guys get the tax advantage. The third party gets the tax advantage. And the people who build it. Yeah. Yeah. The construction. Yeah. All yeah. right, gentlemen. Well, welcome right, um, gentlemen. to the well, new well, members. Thank you for uh, being in attendance. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, again, hopefully we'll be able to all meet in person in the next few months. Yes, Bob. Joe. Yes, Bob. Uh, this uh, yes, Bob. Mulberry Road, you withdrew. That's a dead issue now? That's a dead issue. They withdrew it, correct. Uh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Sure. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Donnie and Christine. Glad to have you. You're welcome. Glad to be part. And glad to have everyone back who has served last year as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so. And congratulations to our reappointed chair and newly appointed vice chair. Yeah, be careful what you ask for. Yeah, you, um, better, you better show up. All right, so <laughs> next month we got a 